Hi, good morning. Uh, it's such a, you know, I feel this is a very God-given moment to us that we can actually have this time to look at, at different ministries as a church and to see how God is shaping us and how God is defining us. And this thing that God has put on my heart to share to you all as a prayer ministry, I feel it's a very defining moment for us. And I would like to start that it was a few years ago when just after service I was walking down these steps and I heard God speak to me so clearly and he said, build me a house of prayer. And when he said these things, immediately that verse came to my mind from Isaiah 57 where he says, for my house shall be called a house of prayer. And the way he spoke to me, the, the words came with such clarity, with such authority, I knew it was God. And so I hid those words in my heart and I wondered how was it that God was going to transform Adonai into that house of prayer. And as years went by, I joined Adonai, I became a member of the staff and it happened that I was given the responsibility to uh, be in charge of the prayer team. And so even when I took on that responsibility, this one thing was clear to me, that the way God looked at Adonai was that he saw it as a house of prayer. He wanted to see Adonai in every prayer meeting, whatever we do, that it would reflect this vision, this heart, that we are a house of prayer. So in 2015, we formed a team, a few of us, and we started meeting every week. We would study the word, we would give ourselves to prayer, we would prepare for the different meetings that we had during the year. We had these weekly meetings of spiritual warfare, we had the monthly meetings of house of prayer, and we had those times of thanksgiving. And we would plan, we would strategize, we would structure, and we would put in all effort that we thought we could to make it a success. And so, uh, over a period of time, we saw that the numbers were not actually increasing. And so we thought, okay, let's try a few different things. And we changed the timings of the meetings. We changed the days of the meetings. We changed the place from the annex. We came to the hall, then again we went back to the annex. And we tried a lot of different things, even the way we conducted our meetings. We changed, we juggled around quite a few things. And it felt as if, like I was trying to get a recipe right, where you, a uh, little more salt, or a little more spice, or a little less of heat, and somehow to get this working, to see prayer come and uh, be a part of our church activities, to see everyone participate in these meetings. But to tell you the truth, I was disappointed. Because what God had envisioned me for, for Adonai, I didn't see it materialize. And over a period of time, I was hit so bad that I actually contemplated just giving up this ministry of prayer. And I thought that I have failed, I'm a failure, and I have no clue as to how to go about this. But I thank God for his encouragement, his comfort at that time. And he spoke to me, and he shared what his heart was, and he had not given up on this vision. So, in that time, I started counting the numbers of how many people actually attended the meetings. And I would go back and I would pray. And I would seek God that, Lord, we need an increase. We want to see more people join in this prayer meeting. We want to see more people join in and be a vision, be a part of this vision of house of prayer. And so even as that was happening, yeah, God spoke to me one time when I was praying. And he rebuked me. And he said, don't count the numbers. It's not the numbers that interest me. And he showed me a vision where I saw a stadium. And there was a game being played on that stadium. And I came to understand that it was my life that was happening, that was being played out there. And as I saw, as I looked around, I was the only person present there. There were no spectators. There were no umpires. There were no other teammates. It was just me alone. And in that place, God spoke to me and said that whatever you do, you do it for me and you do it with me. I am your spectator, I am your encourager, I am your teammate, I am your umpire. And so, whatever you do, do it keeping me in mind. And it was a big lesson for me. And from that place, I learned to be more sensitive to God. I learned to be more accommodating to God in our meetings. Even as a team, we learned to hear God when we met in our times of prayer. So, when we meet now, oh, God is so good. There is such an uh, increase in the way his 
uh, presence ministers to us. Why? Because we allowed him to come in. And during worship, there are words that come. During time of prayers, he impresses an image on our heart. There are scriptures that stand out. And, in, and we see God so involved with us in prayer. And we see such clarity, such direction in those times of prayer that we have every Friday morning. And now, when I come out of those meetings, there's such a greater sense of accomplishment. There's such a greater sense of direction and purpose when we meet. And it's been an awesome journey from the place where we started. It's been slow, but it's been steady. And even though the years come to an end, yeah, it, God is still working on, and He still has greater things for us. So, as Pastor said a, few, a month ago, even as we were waiting on God for direction, I looked back at 2015, and I saw that though these things were happening, and God was in it, and God was moving, we didn't really see that vision of Adonai becoming a house of prayer materialize. We didn't really see people catching that heart. Though the meetings were going well, though we experienced God, though prayers were being answered, but to see what God had on His heart, uh, it didn't happen. So, I didn't know how to go forward. I was so lost. And again in that place, God gave direction. And I'm so thankful that God speaks. Yeah, that we can come to Him and He speaks. He spoke through the prophets. He spoke through the Word. But even today, He speaks and He gives us direction. And in that place... God spoke to me something very significant. And he said, prayer is not an activity. Prayer is a lifestyle. And it hit me when he said those things because till now, I had made, I had made prayer an activity in Adonai. The focus was so much on getting the meetings right, on getting the numbers right, on getting the, the points right. And in all of it, it had become an activity. And I gauged how, prayer, how Adonai did in prayer by how the meeting went how the meeting went. If the meeting went well, if there were a good number of people, then I would think to myself, oh, it's good. And that's how it became where it was the meetings or the number of people attending those meetings that determined the prayer. But God said, prayer is not an activity. And someone has said that prayer is not an emergency exit. Prayer is a lifestyle. And I don't know, sometimes there are uh, those places where we look at prayer only in times of need. Only in times of crisis is when we really look to prayer. But prayer is so much more. Prayer is to commune with God. Prayer is to be in that place to hear from Him. Prayer in that place where we receive power, we receive direction, where we receive that encouragement that we need in the now moment. And so God was doing something in my heart at that moment. And I see it doing it in our church also. You remember Bishop Cliff who came to us a few weeks ago? And he said that the word God had put on his heart was for us to get our prayer life straight, to get our personal prayer straight. And even when Pastor Victor spoke to us last week, the word that he brought out about praying in the fullness of Christ, yeah, he told us that prayer is to align ourselves with God. It's not an activity, it's a lifestyle. It's a place where we learn to be intimate with God. It's a place where we learn to come and know God, to hear from God and to dwell with Him. And so, even as we are here, uh, I would really like to share this with you that there's going to be a big change in our church, in our personal lives, because God has called us to be a people of prayer. Yeah, we see that when in the book, in We see that when God speaks, when Jesus speaks, he said, not if you pray, but when you pray. Just last week when we were having spiritual warfare, God again spoke. And this time it was such a sobering vision that he gave me. And he showed me a soldier. And this soldier was equipped. This soldier had his spear. His soldier had his shield. He was wearing his helmet, his armor, and he was fully ready to go into battle. But when I saw the soldier, though he was standing, he was fast asleep. And I was so shocked to see that, you know, the soldier who is so trained, who has spent years in training, who has been equipped in every way, when he finally arrives on the battlefield, he's sleeping. And you know the amount of money that the government spends on training soldiers? It goes into thousands, if not lakhs. 
And imagine that one such soldier, when it's fully trained, when he's fully equipped, when we send him to the line of the, when to, to the border, and he sleeps over there. He goes and he sleeps over there. And God was telling me that Sunday after Sunday, we have come here, we have received truth. We have received revelation. We have received such insight into his word. There have been times when we have been ministered so richly by the worship. There have been times when we have been healed and delivered. We have experienced God for who he is. But when it came for, our, for us to take action, we have been so complacent. We have been so lazy. And we have forgotten that we are soldiers in the battlefield. We have forgotten our identity as to why we exist. And God was speaking so sharply to me. And he said that in all of these things, we have lacked. It's high time that we see that we have tolerated this one sin of not praying. The reason I call it a sin is because God tells us, pray at all times. Pray for your authorities. Fast for the oppressed. And it's his command to us to be a people of prayer. And we have fallen short in that. And I say that for all of us. Because it is as a church that God will accomplish what he wants to accomplish through us. You know, even when a mobile malfunctions, yeah, we call it defective, when it doesn't do the things that it's supposed to do, in the same way when a Christian does not pray, there's something wrong. It's an inherent character for a Christian to pray. The psalmist says that the righteous calls upon the name of the Lord. Yeah? Even when Saul encountered Jesus and uh, he met with God, and then God said to Ananias to go and pray for him so that his eyes may be opened. At that point, God told Ananias, look, he prays. Yeah? And that was the first thing that you see when, Paul, when Saul encountered Jesus, he became a man of prayer. And prayer is something that defines our Christian walk. And God has made it so crucial for us to be a people of prayer. You know, when we don't pray, we are like a sheep without a shepherd. We don't hear God, we don't receive direction, we don't receive any insight, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, power, and we, we go astray. And we don't fulfill the very destinies that God has for us. I'm sure many of us over here would like to be used of God, would like to be uh, walking in the same power and authority as we read about others, to have a demonstration of that uh, holy, to have a demonstration of the gifts and the the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But we don't have that because we don't have a lifestyle of prayer. And so today, I really want to challenge us all that let's look at our lives. Let's get pray, prayer straight in our lives and let's cultivate a lifestyle of prayer. You see in the book of, in the Gospels, when just before Jesus was arrested, he took the disciples with him into the Garden of Gethsemane. And you, you remember this time where uh, Jesus has just been betrayed. You remember this time where he has gone through the things that he has gone through, being persecuted, being spoken ill of, and being plotted against. And he knew all these things. And in that time, he chose to take the disciples with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And once there, he asked them, will you pray with me? Will you watch with me? And he went in. And you see him sweating drops of blood. You see him praying earnestly because he knew what was there before him. He knew the reality of sin. He knew the cross. And he expected his disciples to be there in him. Can you imagine the Son of God, the Savior of this earth, asking his disciples to pray with him? Yeah. And when he returned, what did he see? In Matthew 26, 40, it says that when he came back, he saw his disciples sleeping. And he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me for one hour? And today, I believe that even as he's in interceding for us in the heavens, even as he's there as our mediator, he looks at his church to partake with him in prayer, to be there with him in prayer, because he cannot accomplish what he wants to without us. And he looks at us to be with him and to intercede with him because he wants to see the nations change. He wants to see the world change. He has done it for us. Now he wants to use us to do it for others. And so today... The, the message that I would like to pray, tell you about is about prayer being a lifestyle. Prayer being not just an activity, but prayer being a lifestyle. 
And I would like to break this message into three points where Jesus first modeled us a lifestyle of personal prayer. The disciples modeled for us a lifestyle of home prayer where they met in homes and they prayed. And thirdly, the church, where the church modeled for us a a corporate lifestyle of prayer. So when we look at prayer to be wholesome in our lives, these three aspects are key. You cannot do without one. All three are key for us to live, that, that, to have that wholesome lifestyle of prayer. So first, let's look at how Jesus modeled for us a lifestyle of prayer. And you see in the gospel so many places where you see Jesus praying. And in Luke 5.16, you see that uh, Luke 5.16 says that Jesus would often withdraw and he would go to lonely places to pray. And Jesus took out time to make sure that he had time for prayer. Despite how hectic, how many people he ministered to, how far he walked, through what desert he walked, he would make sure that he had prayer, that he would not give up on this lifestyle of prayer. And the disciples took notice of these moments of prayer of Jesus. You see there's an incident in the Gospels where they brought a demon, demonized boy to the disciples. And, the, de- and the, the disciples could not cast out that demon. You'll remember this incident? And then the same boy was brought to Jesus. And Jesus was able to cast out that demon. And the disciples were perplexed. And they asked, what is it that we, why is it that we couldn't cast out this demon? And Jesus said that this kind can only be cast out by fasting and prayer. And he was highlighting a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. We cannot look at prayer as an activity and expect to walk in what God has for us. He has made prayer to be a lifestyle. So the disciples connected the ministry of Jesus to his time in prayer. And that's why they didn't ask him how to cast out demons, teach us how to raise the dead or teach us how to heal the sick. But the one thing they asked of him was teach us how to pray. Because they knew that if they got this aspect of prayer right, they would get all the other things right. If they had a lifestyle of prayer, the purpose, the the destiny that God had for them would fall in place. Today, many of us are in that place where we try to do all these things, where we see the gospel talking about all these things, but in our own lives, prayer has become an activity. Only in crisis, only in times where we find the pressure building, we come before God. But to keep it as a discipline, to keep it as a lifestyle, is what makes it work. You know, the enemy fears a praying Christian the most. He doesn't fear a Christian who knows a lot. He doesn't fear a Christian who does a lot of activity. But a Christian that prays invites something of God in that place. Invites the presence of God in that place. You are being uh, a doorway, a doorway for God to intervene in that place. And it is prayer that sharpens us. It's prayer That is the violence we use against the enemy to progress. So whenever we pray, it's so much more of God that takes hold of our lives. Coming to a place of prayer actually means that we are humbling ourselves. We are seizing from our efforts. We are seizing from the things that we know best and we look to God. And that is why prayer is something that gets things done. Why? Because we are asking God to do it on our behalf. We are trusting God to do it on our behalf. Andrew Murray, he's a writer, he's a famous writer. He he has written a lot of books on prayer and on intercession. And he says that wherever there is prayer, there is more of the Spirit. And wherever there is more of the Spirit, there is an increase in prayer. And you will see that when we start praying initially, it can be an effort. But as we start praying, you will have an experience of God's presence. You will sense God's presence even more tangibly. And as we are drawn into that presence of God, we find ourselves depending more on God, praying more to God. And that's how this works, where we develop, we cultivate that lifestyle of prayer. And so, what God showed me for 2016 is that we need to move from this mindset, from making prayer an activity, to making it a lifestyle. And I don't know how many of us have uh, been in that place where 
the, ta- the way we pray during crisis, the way we pray during when things go wrong or when someone is sick and the way we are the other days. And God says that that is not the way things are going to work. We need to make it a lifestyle. The second thing that I would like to show is that the disciples modeled prayer in the home groups. And you see that in Acts where after they saw Jesus ascend and Jesus told them, wait in Jerusalem till you receive power from on high, till I make you witnesses to the ends of the earth. And after they had heard Jesus and after they saw him risen up, they returned back to Jerusalem, all the disciples. And what did they do? They continued in one accord with prayer. Not only the men, but also the women. And we find that this lifestyle of prayer that they had picked up on Jesus, that they saw Jesus cultivate, they had brought it with them. And so even when they met, they knew the significance of prayer. They knew what it meant to be united in prayer. And that's what they knew was the best thing to do. You know, if we want to learn to pray corporately, the cell groups, the home cell groups that we have is the best place. We have grown to be such individualistic people where our needs come before others. And we see in the second, where, in the second verse, in Acts 2.42, it says then they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines, in fellowship, in breaking of bread and prayer. And I find that the church grew so fast in the book of Acts. The church experienced such miracles, such outpouring of the Spirit, such encounters with God because they were a people who knew how to pray corporately. And you see that the fellowship that they enjoyed, you know when you pray for someone, it's the best way to grow in relationship with that person. Whenever we pray for someone, there's a knitting at a very deep level that happens, where you're upholding that person, where you're walking in the shoes of that person, where you're relating to that person, and you're praying for that person, you're identifying with that person. And the church in Acts did that. And in our cell groups, we need to have that kind of prayer. We need to see an increase where we are not just people for ourselves, but for others. It is a fulfillment of the second commandment where God says, love others as you love yourself. It breaks that individualism and it makes us a people who know what it is to live as a community, to live as one body, having one mind and one heart. You know, the way we see prayer offered from these groups in the book of Acts When there was a crisis, they would pray. When there was a need, they would pray. They would pray for the disciples. They would pray for the apostles. They would send help. And they were so one, knit together with everyone. Why? Because they were praying for each other. And they upheld each other. And that's what we can see in our own cell groups. You know, when we meet together, we can expect such a presence of God. Because the dynamics change completely. Because if one can put 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000. And so when we come together as a group, as a community, there is a different dynamics at work when we address, when we pray. And what happens is when we meet in communities, when we meet in our cell groups, we can pray for our areas. We can pray for each other. We cannot do that on Sundays where there are so many of us and we cannot individually go and ask what is your need and can we pray for. But in our cell groups, we can have that kind of intercession happen. We can have a place where we can uphold different needs of the church or different needs that we see, the crisis that is happening in the world today. We can be a people of prayer and we can start learning to walk in corporate prayer. Uh, There is a prayer movement that is going on that is called My Street Prayer. And in this movement, what uh, the aim is that that every person takes responsibility for the street where they live and they start praying for that street. Amazing, right? And can you imagine if we start praying for a street that, Lord, let there be no rapes, let there be no thefts, no crime, let there be your peace that guards this place, that you would intervene in every family's life and that be a revelation of your truth. And can you imagine that if all of us take responsibility of the streets where we live, we can expect Bangalore to be transformed. So much more when we meet us in our cell groups. We can pray for our areas. We can pray for the different situations, for the different things. Uh, we have allowed the enemy to rule. We have allowed the enemy to dictate terms to us. Yeah, but now we can take charge. We can get into action. No more sleeping soldiers, but we can go forth and we can work out the plans of God. When we pray corporately, we are propelling or we are advancing the kingdom of God. When we pray corporately, we are setting into motion the things that God has for us. 
I would like to share an incident where we meet on Fridays for prayer. And in one such meeting, we were impressed to pray for the garbage situation that was very bad in Bangalore. And when we started praying, it was just for a week or two weeks that we prayed. And we saw immediately God intervene. The chief of the municipal corporation resigned and he was replaced by another person. And this person took action. He made sure that the streets were clean. He said they started, the government started imposing fines. They started uh, collecting garbage regularly. They enforced laws. They enforced strict action on those people who collect garbage. They made sure that the corrupt officials were suspended. And all just because of few of, because of a few of us getting together to pray. And I saw it with my own eyes. You all can go and look it up in Google. This is a reality. When we start taking responsibility and ownership of our areas, of our streets, we will see transformation. And the cell groups are a very good place to start there. In that place, again I say, you can learn to start praying corporately, where it's not so much about one person, but it's about a body seeing the need and coming together. Thirdly, the church model corporate prayer. There's a scripture that says in Acts 3.1, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And you see that the church had set aside an hour of prayer. The church had developed a lifestyle of corporate prayer. And we see that in so many instances when uh, the seven were separated, including Stephen, for serving. The church came together and prayed for them. The time when Paul and Barnabas had to be separated from ministry, the church fasted and prayed for them. And then they sent them out. When Peter was arrested, the church stood by and prayed. And there was a miracle where Peter was uh, set free from that prison. And we see that the prayer, the church knew that the answer was prayer. And they had developed a lifestyle where even if it was night, they got together and they prayed. There's another scripture where we see that when, they, when the persecution had increased against them and they were threatened not to use the name of Jesus, what did the church do? They got together and they prayed. And it says in Acts 4.31, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. When we pray as a church, we cooperate with God to set His plans in motion. When we pray, we see the Holy Spirit being poured out. We look at it in the book of Acts that when the church got together, fear of God came upon the people around them. When the church got together, they saw wonders and signs breaking out. They saw healings. They saw people being ministered to, people being met with, with the Holy Spirit being outpoured, tongues being given out. And we see such dimensions of God's kingdom coming through. But if you look at the way the church is now, instead of the people fearing us, we fear the people. Both the world and the church are looking for signs and wonders. Why? Because it's such a rarity. But that's not how we are meant to be. We need to get back into a lifestyle of prayer, of corporate prayer. We need to be back in that place where we see prayer being the source to empower us to see what Jesus is doing, to be in that place where we come alongside with Him and see His plan set in motion. The bottom line of what I would like to share that God put on my heart. And I pray that this is the vision that you will carry for Adonai in 2016. And it's in, again in Isaiah 56, 7, and we'll read it, where God says, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Till now, we focused on cities and communities. That's what our vision over here says. But now, I believe God is calling us for the nations. He's calling us where the nations would come to this place and experience God. Where nations will come to this place and have abandoned times of worship. Where nations will come to this place and experience the reality of His presence. But it's all linked to us being a house of prayer. It's all rooted in us knowing and and walking in a lifestyle of corporate prayer. I trust that we will not be complacent in this. 
I trust that even as God is giving us this vision, it's not a place of rebuke, but He wants to bring in direction to us. He wants to envision us. He wants to encourage us that, okay, we have been here, we have been comfortable, but this is what God has called us out for. This is how He sees us. You know, the world there is a place of need. And we are that city on a hill that the world is looking for. We are those people that God wants to be, make us the answer for the world out there. And so I trust that even as I've shared this with you all, that is the Holy Spirit that ministers to your heart. That it is the Spirit confirming it with your spirit. And it is not so much of our logic or it's not so much about our strategy, but it's about what God is going to do in the coming months. Just to put things in perspective, you know, me being here is because this church prayed. I am basically from Pune, and I was saved there. But I was told that I need to come to Adonai because they have a ministry of healing and deliverance. And that's where I'll find my answers. Because though I was saved, I was bound, I was hopeless, I was a failure, I had no hope, I had no direction, I had nothing left in me. The only thing was that I knew I was saved. But I lived almost like a miserable life. And the reason why I heard that is because the news and the the testimonies that went out from this place had reached Pune. And so when I came here, what happened? I experienced all those things. And I experienced God to be a reality. And it all happened because this ministry was birthed by prayer. This ministry was when few people got together and they started praying that, Lord, we want to see this happen. We open our hearts for your vision, for your plans to come to pass. And now it has come to pass. I am here in this place because of what those few people prayed for and sustained. And now God is calling us for a greater purpose. He's envisioning us that even as we have tasted and we have experienced, we need to be those people of prayer to see those nations out there come and be ministered to. Those nations out there come and be restored in this place. One thing I strongly believe God challenging us is that we need to spend at least an hour of prayer every day. You see that with Jesus where he asked the disciples, couldn't you watch with me one hour? One hour. You know, if Jesus, who knew that he just had three and a half years here on the earth, yeah, if he took out time and he made sure that he had that one, he had that time of prayer with God, No matter how hectic the day was, no matter what time he slept, what time he woke up, but he had that time of prayer. The disciples, though the church grew, though there were multitudes that were being added, they gave up other responsibilities. And we see that in Acts 6, where they gave up other responsibilities, but they made sure that this lifestyle of prayer continued with them. So much more for us. If we want to see the fullness of what God has for us, if we want to see what really God wants to unfold through us. We need to be a people of prayer. And I'm not saying this to uh, daunt you, but that one hour of prayer is possible. That one hour of prayer is something that God is equipping us and calling us to. It's not something of our flesh, of our effort, but it's what God wants to do through us. But even as I say this, I know there are a few obstacles that when we say, when we decide that we want to spend time in prayer, there are a few things that come in the way. And I've listed out three of the common things that hinder our prayer life. The first and the most common being busyness. We have become a people that are so busy that we don't have time for the real things of life. And that is the biggest complaint that I don't have time to pray. But what we value in our life, we will have time for. You know, it's a good place to see what we spend our time on because it indicates what we really value in our lives. And looking at the disciples, looking at Jesus, looking at the men of God, yeah, prayer should be right up there. You decide, you plan your day so that you have the time for prayer. The second thing is sleep. Why do I say sleep? Because we are a machine that God has designed. And we are designed to work in a certain way. And when we don't get enough rest, when we work more than we should and we rest less than we should, We don't function the way we should. And we wake up feeling lethargic. We wake up feeling tired. And we wake up feeling discouraged because we don't have enough rest. 
And so when God uh, designed us, He kept our rest in mind. And we need at least six to eight hours of sleep. And we trust God that the way He's designed us, He'll also fulfill whatever things He has for the day. The third thing is about indiscipline. And this is the biggest thing that robs us of our destiny. The Bible says that a man who does not have self-control is like a city whose walls are broken down. Anyone can plunder. And when we walk in indiscipline, basically we are letting the enemy rob us. We are letting the plan of God, the destiny of God just go by. And so when, even when God says that I have not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, can you complete that? Of power, love, and sound mind. Some, some scriptures say self-control. And that is what God has made us. And we need to walk in that self-control, in that discipline. You know, when Jesus was here on the earth, twice he had to cleanse the temple. Twice he came and he found that the temple was not what it was intended, intended to be and he cleaned, cleansed it. And the reason being that he said that prayer was a priority in the temple. He said that my father's house is to be a house of prayer. And today he looks at us as a temple of God. And he says that this house should be a house of prayer. And he's here to cleanse all those obstacles, all those things that we find difficult to deal with. He's here to help us. And if you just make that choice, you give him that space in your heart, he's there to bring this to pass. Where he wants to make this house a prayer, house of prayer for the nations. He wants to make this place a blessing for nations to come. So here are a few ways we can go about it. Firstly, we make prayer a priority. We give importance to prayer in our personal life. You want to see more of God. You want to see uh, intimacy with God. You want to see His purposes, His plans. You want to see direction. Make prayer a priority. Secondly, the things that have taken the priority of over prayer, you see what is important. You will know that these things that have clogged your life, make a routine where you give space for prayer. Decide on the time, decide on the place and give yourself to at least an hour of prayer. And what you do is you schedule your day around that. And the reason I'm saying this so strongly is because I believe that God has called us. This is a season where He wants us to be rich in sowing prayers. He wants us to be a people that know there's a harvest waiting for us. But if we don't rise up, if we don't grow to that place, we can miss that season. And so, Let's make it a routine, a discipline where we give ourselves to pray at least once. Come for the meetings, even the meetings in cell groups. The reason why, they are, why we pray in cell groups, the reason why we should cultivate a lifestyle of prayer in cell groups is because it helps us to grow in corporate prayer. At the end of the day, we are identified as the body of Christ. We are identified as the members of the body of Christ. And so we should learn to pray corporately. And it's in cell groups where we can learn to be united in prayer, to be led by the Holy Spirit, to be in a place where it's not just about us, but what God has on His heart, to see the areas, to see the city being transformed. You know, whenever the, the home cell groups met, there was such direction, such uh, empowerment of God that came upon them. There is a church in South Korea where the people that are added to the church is because of the home cell groups. Because in the home cell groups, they see such a presence of God where people are healed, where people come and they experience transformation. And that's just because the way they have learned to pray corporately. And we need to see that in our home cell groups. And lastly, come for the church meetings. Build your life around corporate prayer. When we come to pray as a, as a church, when we come to pray uh, as one body, you know, we are in a place... We are aligning ourselves with God to see His plans come to pass. We are in a place where we see the fullness of God being manifested through us. The work that God has kept is through us as a church. The vision that God has given us is through us as a church. And we need to pray as a church. Finally, I would like to end with this invitation that God gives for all of us. And He says this in Jeremiah 33, 3, that call to me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things. And this is God's invitation for us to this season of prayer, where 
he's showing us a picture, a glimpse of what is in store for us, the things that he would like to do through us. But he's saying, come, be a people of prayer. Cultivate a lifestyle of prayer. Be in that place where I can make you an answer to the nations. And I trust that this has spoken to you. I trust that you have been envisioned by this. You know, Colossians, if you have that scripture, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 to 3. Colossians, open your Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 4. And this is like an instruction that, uh, that uh, uh, the Apostle Paul is giving to the church. Colossians 4, 2. Okay, verse 3. But open, open your Bibles to Colossians. You know where Colossians are? Yeah, okay. Somewhere in the New Testament towards the end. Okay, Colossians. It says, continue earnestly. Can you say the word earnestly? Say it again, earnestly. Continue earnestly in prayer. Be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So always prayer and thanksgiving are linked up together. So it says, continue earnestly and be vigilant. Be vigilant, be determined in prayer. You know, when the enemy uh, uh, wants to rob us of uh, the blessings of God, the direction that uh, uh, God has for us, he will rob us of prayer. Because prayer, now, if you want to talk to me, all someone has to do is cut the phone connection. The minute the phone connection is, is cut, you cannot communicate to me because the phone lines are cut. In the same way, the enemy tries to cut our connection with God, and when our connection is cut, we can't receive the revelation from God. We cannot receive instruction from God. You know, this morning was an, uh, a bit of a different situation where uh, I got up late. Uh, okay, now when I say I got up late, I'm, uh, to you all, you all might be thinking that's very early. I got up at 5 o'clock. Okay, now, uh, I normally get up earlier than that. Okay, yeah. Uh, but uh, so when I look at the time five and I'm feeling tired, I'm thinking, I sleep in a little more. What? I just felt, you know, pull myself out of bed. Now that's being vigilant. You, you're vigilant. You, you, you don't sit in bed and pray. That's the last thing you can do. If you do, want to be sincere in prayer, never have bedtime prayers. Get up from your bed. And so I got to the bed, got out of bed, made myself a cup of uh, tea, and I'm still feeling, your eyes are still closing. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We, we get up from bed, but we still sleep walking. And I sat on my chair, I tried to pray, nothing was happening. I lay down a bit and tried to meditate, nothing was happening. I sat down again, and I said, uh, and I began to reflect on, the, on, on God, the character of God. You know, the best way to start prayer is look at God. So encouraging to look at God. Worship is so important. Don't miss worship. Sunday morning worship, day to day. Worship is, is a, a huge factor in my life. Uh, I have a lot of worship songs. I put worship music on. I listen to a lot of worship music. Why? Because worship is about who God is. And when you focus on who God is, he gives you perspective on, on what life on earth is like. And so as that happened, my whole, you know, uh, aspect of prayer was such a wonderful time, significant time, more than wonderful, is because I persevered in prayer. And uh, normally, that will happen to all of us. We don't just get up into bed and then get in right there. It's a journey that we need to take. We break through those barriers of laziness, sleepiness, all of that. We apply ourselves, we... Uh, to, to, to meditate on God and worship God. And before you know it, God comes in. God stirs your heart. God puts a revelation, puts something in your heart that ignites your heart. And, and the next thing, you're flowing in prayer, you're flowing in thanksgiving. Prayer and thanksgiving is so important. Uh, how many of you remember last Sunday's uh, message? Last Sunday's message, aligning yourself. We live in two worlds. What are the two worlds we live in? Can you see that? The spiritual world and the physical world, two worlds we live in. Now, at the end of the service, I prayed that God will open our spiritual eyes so that we could live in both the realms. Didn't I pray that? Now, I didn't know God was going to do something in my own life. 
I don't know how much happened in your life. I trust that God will open your spiritual eyes and you keep that as a goal. Say, God, I want to be tuned in to your spiritual realm and understand what's happening there. God opened my eyes to the spiritual realm uh, that Monday and something was so different, a new perspective. And uh, I want to share a little bit of, of that because uh, um, Sunday mornings you don't get much to you know, share everything. But I just felt something to highlight for, uh, to us this morning. You see, Jesus, when he was on earth, he never connected physical problems with his father. Now, this is a change of our thinking. He looked at a physical problem and he connected spirit to spirit. You got what I'm saying? All understood what I'm saying? We and I all along have connected God's spirit, God, to physical circumstances. And very often, we highlight the physical circumstances so much that we even fail to connect God in a meaningful way to it. We only bring forth our, our crisis to God. But Jesus never looked at the physical world and looked at the Father for solutions in the physical world. He looked for solutions in the spirit world, and as a result of that, it affected the spiritual, it affected the spiritual world. Let me give you an example. You remember the time it says, and uh, you can take down these references, do your own homework, because I'm not preaching a message here this morning. I'm just adding uh, to what uh, Ruth is saying, so that we learn to align ourselves. We give ourselves to prayer. And uh, I shared that the first son, son, service, I'm not going to preach this message again. You do your homework, you study the word, and you will be enriched. Mark chapter 5 talks about how this man was a demon possessed with a legion of demons. How many of you read that story? You know that story. This man was, had a legion of demons. Look at how the Bible describes him in verse 2 and 3. He, uh, verse 3 in Mark chapter 5. He was a man dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him. No one can hold him down, not even the chains. He was so strong because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. All that iron chains were shattered in pieces because there was more than physical strength. Nothing can hold him down. And then it says here, neither could anyone tame him. He couldn't restrict him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. And so he was self-destructive. And so when you get self-destructive, it's the enemy at work. Now, Jesus looked at this man and didn't look at him and say, okay, now, which is the best hospital for this guy? We would have sent him straight to Nimans. And Nimans would have taken the big injection and poked him, sedated him, knocked him out, sleep. When he wakes up again, give him another injection. See, that's how we live our lives. We connect physical things and we are looking for physical answers in the physical world. And that's why we have a lot of dead ends. Because some answers you will never find in the physical world. It's rooted in the spiritual world. Now look at how Jesus lived. I got your attention. Look at how Jesus looked at this man. He looked at the condition of this man and connected spirit world to spirit world. And he knew that the reason why this man was in such a condition is because there was an evil influence, the spiritual world of darkness, which has had an effect upon his life, taking control of his body, taking control of his mind, and as a result, the devil was destroying him. And so he didn't deal with the individual, he dealt with the spirit of darkness. The minute he rebuked the legion of demons, the demon says, look, we've gone so used to living in this body, we've gone so used to living in this territory, so please, if we have to leave this body, don't send us out of this place, we like this area. You thought only you like Brigade Road? Even demons like certain roads and certain places. They like to hang around that. And so Jesus says, okay, anywhere, you have to hang out somewhere. And he says, okay, you, you're released. Give permission. And the demon said, 
the bible says the demons went into the pigs and all the pigs drowned themselves into the water the reason why demons went into pigs because pigs were there if there were dogs around it would have gone into dogs if there were cows it would have gone into cows so don't make a doctor and think don't eat pork <laughs> this this it just happened that the pigs were there they couldn't go anywhere else this guy was in a tomb couldn't find a human body went into a body of an animal spirit world to spirit world i'll give you another ex- example here in 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 the bible when it comes to sickness when it comes to sickness acts chapter 10 verse 38 how god anointed jesus christ with the holy spirit who went about doing good healing all that were oppressed with the devil now look at me we look at physical sickness and we look for a physical solution but jesus looked at a physical condition look at me and he connected spirit world to spirit world and he saw that mankind was oppressed by the enemy and he dealt with the spiritual world of darkness and when he dealt with the spiritual world of darkness people were healed physically spirit world and physical world go together when a man came with deaf and dumb he didn't look at it and say father please you are the creator of heaven and earth oh god you created a man with a mouth to speak so god do something he didn't look at god as the cause of his problem he looked at the man and he looked at the spiritual world of god who created him with a mouth to speak and he looked at the spiritual world of darkness and he rebuked that dumb spirit he rebuked the deaf spirit and the man began to speak how many of you know what i'm talking about this morning come on wave at me if you know what i'm talking about yeah you see how much of our life is controlled by both these worlds you may not realize it but today you are a result of what's happening in the spiritual world over your life you control we influence by in the spiritual world look at the time when the, the the crowd gathered together and there was a need jesus looked at the people and they said no food been there the whole day and didn't he didn't say hey watch me i'm the son of god Shhh, bread came into his hand did jesus do that then he said look Shhh, fish came into his hand Huh? Hey, he's not Sai Baba. <laughs> Jesus was never a magician. He looked at the spiritual realm for a physical need. And they got a five loaves two fish. And he says, "God bless it." And when the father blessed it, it multiplied. God works with the physical world. and the physical world must learn how to work and cooperate with the spiritual world that's what a christian is that's what christian life is all about are you blessed this morning some of you are praying for salvation and we got prayer points for you this morning you're praying for people to be saved and you're praying and praying nothing is happening you know why we're connecting spiritual world physical world the bible says in 2 corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 the god of this world that is satan and his demons have blinded the eyes of those who do not see the hope which is in the gospel so god connects spiritual world to spiritual world you like to say that after me i must connect spiritual world to spiritual world and so what happened when you deal with the god of this world which has blinded people's eyes the minute the spiritual eyes are opened they receive salvation and so our fight the apostle paul knew how to live in both the worlds no wonder he was so successful he says our fight is not against flesh and blood but against principalities powers and rulers you know to get people to to understand that my god it's a it's a headache because somehow we are so bound to the physical it's so difficult to uh, to get christians to understand hey 
It is not just a physical world we're living in. We're living in a spiritual world. And the Apostle Paul says, our fight, our struggle is not just in the physical realm. And some of us are trying and trying and trying all sorts of things in the physical world and hitting a dead end. Probably you need to plug into God and see that you will find a, a greater breakthrough when you connect the spiritual realm to the spiritual realm and it, which affects the physical world. He said, Lord, This is what you want. And this is what the enemy wants. And I stand there and we resist the enemy. And as you resist the enemy, you begin to see the outworking of that in the physical realm. Align yourself with God's word. Align yourself with God. And when you align yourself, they that know God shall be strong. And so this morning, uh, as Ruth and shared, God wants to move us on into this whole aspect of prayer. It's a habit. Say, prayer must be my habit. And when you pray, prayer means speaking, talking. What does prayer mean? Talking to God. You don't talk to God. Then doors are. Speak it out. Whisper. Talk to God. That's what prayer is. Talk to God. Engage with God. Communicate with God. Thank you for listening to this message. To know more about us, please visit www.adonai-ministries.com.